It's my immense pleasure this morning to introduce our professor, Uwe Gielen. Uwe Gielen is a professor emeritus and executive director of the Institute for International and Cross-Cultural Psychology at San Francisco College. Uh, his work centers on Chinese American immigrant children and young adults, cross-cultural and international psychology, and international family psychology. His publications include 28 edited and co-edited volumes. He has served as president of the Society for, uh, for Cross-Cultural Research, the International Council of Psychologists, and the International Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association. So let's extend a warm welcome to our very own distinguished scholar, Uwe Gillen. Thank you, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lemek, and uh, good morning to uh, all of you. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, Chinese immigrants. And that's a very appropriate topic because the forum on migration is being established at St. Francis College. Here are the two co-directors, right? and that will be a big deal for the college. Right? Uh, the title is Dragon Sea Chinese Immigrant Youth in New York. And New York has about 650,000 to maybe 700,000 uh, Chinese persons, right? Not counting foreign students, right? Just sort of more or less immigrants, right? The title uh, comes from uh, Dragon Sea, a term sometimes used for uh, Chinese, because in the Chinese way of thinking, Dragons are good creatures, not like these nasty European fire spy, uh, spying dragons, right? And they're up there somewhere in heaven, and they're a symbol of benign celestial powers, right? And uh, that's uh, why you find this title. New York is actually the largest, quote, Chinese city in the Western Hemisphere. And some people think it's LA, you know, or maybe Vancouver has a lot of Chinese uh, immigrants. No, it is New York. And that doesn't include the more than 200,000 who live in the larger metropolitan area. Right. So uh, it's quite impressive. Right. That's what we're going to do. Uh, briefly say a little bit about the Chinese in New York City. Then I'm going to discuss an essay project that involves 82 participants of Chinese uh, background. Then I'm going to say a little bit about the educational performance of uh, Chinese immigrants here in the city. And then just a few conclusions. First of all, where do the Chinese immigrants come from? Well, they come mostly from the southern eastern part, originally from Taishan, uh, starting in the late 19th century. Right? And for a while, Taishanese, a Chinese dialect, was the number one dialect in New York City. Then, more Cantonese speakers came from Guangdong province. So if you would have come here, let's say, in 1966, Chinatown, there was only one in those days, uh, would have been Cantonese and Taishanese speaking. But since the 1980s, the largest group of immigrants comes from Fujian province. They still speak another sort of a Fujiao dialect. And if you go now, let's say, to uh, Brooklyn Chinatown, you know, in Sunset Park, that will be the largest community. Right. So it has changed. And then, of course, there are also Chinese from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, uh, from France even, and so on and so on. Right. 
There's a picture of New York City. Uh, that's LaGuardia Airport. Here we have Flushing and Queens. Uh, that probably has the largest number of Chinese uh, origin persons in New York City, more than 200,000, many of them sort of middle class, right? Uh, and often Mandarin speaking. Mandarin is sort of the main language in China, right? The oldest Chinatown is in Manhattan, probably most of you have seen it, right? And that goes back to the 19th century. It's not the oldest Chinatown in the U.S., that would be San Francisco, right? And then, starting in the 1980s, rather recently, Brooklyn Chinatown, right, which is uh, now much larger, actually, uh, than Manhattan Chinatown. Right? So within a few decades, you got a totally new game in Sunset Park. Sunset Park in the 1980s, early 80s, if you would have gone there, it was a rundown neighborhood with a lot of shut uh, uh, buildings and so on, you would think, you know, that's a lousy uh, way to start Chinatown, but you go there now and the changes are amazing. Here we are in the crossing between Canal Street and Mott Street, sort of like the center of the old Chinatown. That's a Tong, right? Uh, yeah, sort of like a business organization. Notice the flag here. It's not China. It's Taiwan. Right? Because back in the 60s and 70s when the U.S. didn't yet have diplomatic relationships with the People's Republic, uh, Taiwan uh, played a pretty big role. Here we are on East Broadway which is now predominantly Fujianese, right? That used to be Hispanic and this, that, and the other, right? So again, only the last few decades did it become, quote, Chinese. Here we are in Flushing, so the number seven train station will be just to the left a little bit, right? This is sometimes called Little Asia, because in addition to persons of Chinese descent, right, the Koreans are there, the more and more Bangladeshis, other Asians, plus Hispanics, and so on, right? So it's not a pure Chinatown, the way that Sunset Park, at least, 8th Avenue is, but it's more mixed. It's also more middle class, and it's more Mandarin speaking as the language that Chinese of different parts of the country and Taiwan and so on are using to communicate with each other. You might have seen this. This is on Canal Street, the largest Buddhist temple in New York City. Right. And notice above the temple says words of pleasure. Right. The Chinese like to gamble right. and go to Atlantic City and other places. That's a somewhat unusual picture. We are in uh, Roosevelt Park in Manhattan Chinatown. You see all these little Chinese kids, plus a few parents in the background. The guy who turns his back on you is rather surprising. He is a Swiss missionary. I talked to, I, I happen to speak German, so I talked to him uh, afterwards about what he was doing there. Right? And he is sort of uh, showing pictures of the little Jesus child and, uh, and so on and so on. Many Chinese are not Christians, of course, right? but they don't mind if their kids listen to this. Right? They're very pragmatic about religion in many cases. Here we are in a shop. Right? Mr. Lion right, is visiting this shop. It's a little bit hard to see, but back here, that's a, what they call a red envelope with a little bit of money in it, right? So Mr. Lion will be paid. Sometimes they do a little dance in front of uh, the business, right? And you can see that, uh, especially in the time around New Year, quite frequently. It's a lot of fun to watch. Typical, traditional Chinese little outfit. Of course, you wouldn't go to school like this. Uh, it's a special day. 
This is a quite interesting picture. She has in her hand uh, the Chinese red flag plus the U.S. flag. She's actually an adopted child, right? She doesn't live in Chinatown. She lives on the Upper West Side, probably. Uh, if I might make a guess, uh, it's quite possible that her uh, adoptive parents are Jewish. Right? And there are more than 10,000 adopted Chinese kids in New York City, or at least that's an estimate I have uh, encountered. One of the lions, uh, many of these lion dancers are in martial arts clubs because you have to be in pretty good shape to do what they do. You know, they get up on their coat hind legs, another person behind him, and uh, it's quite athletic. Now let me say something about uh, the Chinese in New York City because in a way they're somewhat unusual and not so typical about Chinese Americans in the United States. Right? They're considerably more likely to be working class than let's say if you go to LA or Vancouver or Toronto or Houston where other Chinatowns are. Right? So notice a third don't have a high school diploma. Right? A good many of them would have gone to middle school but then stopped by quite a few, uh, not even that. Right? Notice, if you look at the Koreans, about 100,000 persons of Korean origin in New York City, they tend to be better educated. Right? So, one characteristic of quite a few Chinese Americans in New York City is this working class background, right? And uh, that's especially true about the Fujianese who have come in recent decades. They often come sort of from villages, small towns in the Min River Delta. Some are fishermen and so on and so on, right? Median household income clearly lower than whites even a little bit lower than New Yorkers in general. Poverty rate, 20%. And if you just look at households with children, it's 25% poverty rate. Right. Again, not that typical for certain other neighborhoods. Of course not, if you go to New Jersey and you look at Chinese families, they're more likely to be sort of middle class and so on than, uh, than this group. Sixty-three percent say they cannot speak English very well, or maybe not at all. Right. Uh, unemployment rates, but the same as for whites. Right. Now, I'm going to say something about what we're going to discuss in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. We're going to look at autobiographical essays, and I'm going to sort of interpret a little bit what we found in these essays. There, we have done another study where we interview people. I'm not discussing this very much today. Of course, uh, we are looking at the various studies. There are a lot of studies on Chinese Americans now. And then our approach is to sort of try to integrate this our essays and interviews with whatever the scientific literature says right, and come up with some overall conclusions right, called triangulation uh, from a research point of view. So, essay contest. The essay contest uh, actually took place uh, about 10 years ago and uh, what we did was we sent this flyer, of course more elaborate than here, to about 600 uh, people who are involved in the Chinese community. Right? Basically, uh, you're between 14 and 24, usually high school or college students in most cases. Uh, submit an autobiographical essay and there was some money involved, that, you know, we picked the best essays and uh, so on. Who were the essay writer writers? Right. 
56 high school students, just one middle school, and 25 college students. Right? Three quarters in English, one quarter in Chinese. We translated those into English, mostly female. When you do studies involving volunteers in psychology, you typically end up with more females than males. Right? They came from 19 high schools, 13 colleges, so they were spread out. Right? It isn't any specific a high school or a college. Right? Of course, there are some students who are less likely to write essays. If you're a high school dropout or whatever, you know, it's not so likely you're going to submit an essay. Right? So it's somewhat skewed, the sample, right? but still fairly representative. They include first generation immigrants, meaning they were born overseas. Right. 1.5, which means they were born overseas but came to the U.S. in the first sort of 10 years of life. Right. And uh, second generation, which means they're born here in the U.S., but uh, at least one of their parents, usually both of their parents, uh, were born overseas. Right. And. Uh, To understand what these essays were talking about, let me give a few quotes. And they're not necessarily from the essays. The first two quotes are by a Chinese Nobel, Chinese American Nobel Prize winner, right, who grew up in the 30s and 40s, back in China, in a little village. Like most Chinese in those days, uh, you lived in a village. Right? My parents suffered from their illiteracy. Three quarters of all Chinese in those days were illiterate. Right? And their suffering made them determined not to have their children follow the same path at any and whatever cost to them. And the point of this is that Chinese parents often make enormous sacrifices. That's the message. Right. They don't want their children to become an illiterate peasant. Right. And uh, the second quote, perhaps it was a Confucius in me, or Confuze, right. the faint voice I often heard when I was alone that the only meaningful life is a life of learning. Notice he's not saying, I want to make money by going to with the university. He's saying, and that's a traditional Confucian conception, that to become a scholar is just about the most noble thing you can do in this life. Right. Of course, in reality, there are many people who go, uh, Chinese Americans who go to college not to be noble scholars, but you know, become accountants or whatever for practical purposes, right? But it still is interesting. Confucius lived about two and a half thousand years ago. He is the single most important philosopher in the Chinese tradition and one of the most influential persons in human history. I think with my stepfather, my mother does not really love him, but she married him for me to come here. Called a green card marriage. Right. Doesn't have a very good reputation because it basically is saying, hey, this is not about love, it's about the daughter to come here. Right. That's one of those sacrifices that the mother is making. Right. Uh, 18-year-old female student attending a community college describes the sacrifice of her mother uh, who married this green card hold. Okay. Next quote. This is by, uh, from a book by Philip Kazinitz. Philip Kazinitz on March 29th will be giving the main talk at St. Francis College when we're going to have a big conference on uh, migration, the biggest ever, as far as I know, at St. Francis College. He will be the keynote speaker, right? And he's well known for having done various books. This is one of them, 
right, in which they compare persons of different ethnic origins within New York City. And they want to know the educational levels, who their parents were, some of their attitudes, and so on. So he's saying, among those eight groups, the Chinese, on average, of course, have moved farther in terms of education. Remember all those uh, parents who didn't even finish high school? And yet their children often go to college, or maybe even graduate school. Right. And even in their attitudes, which of course presents a problem, because if the Chinese parents have different attitudes from their adolescent kids, needless to say, uh, that is not easy to deal with. Right. And that's pretty common. Finally, uh, a college student, right, she's saying, Chinese and Asian parents in general are more strict than most Americans are used to. Right? Is that good or bad? Well, she would rather have uh, grown up in uh, sort of a more easygoing household. Right? And one reason why she said this is she actually has a Jewish boyfriend. And the parents aren't too happy about this, and they have one very good reason. They don't speak English. So if she marries this boyfriend, which she wants to do, there's going to be a communication problem with her parents and her husband. Still another essay. Quite a few of the people that wrote these essays and also the ones we interviewed sort of said, look, there were very clear expectations when I grew up. Right? It's almost like my parents said, this is what you should be doing in life. Right? And they would say that's not once, but five million times. Right? Therefore, so she claims, I couldn't really create my own identity. It was sort of shaped for me, at least to a good degree. Right? And again, she isn't the only one, of course, who thinks in those terms. So, what were the essay topics about? Right? Here are six, and not the only ones, but six that were mentioned by quite a few. First, those are the ones who were born overseas and came here. Right? what it meant for them to come to the United States, specifically New York City. Uh, often they didn't speak English or hardly any English, and then they were sent to school, right? and of course things are difficult. Family relationships, needless to say, striving for academic success, a big topic in the Chinese-American community. A lot wrote about discrimination. Right. Uh, so we're not talking about something that occasionally happens, but especially if they were living in racially mixed, poor neighborhoods. They would have problems in their respective schools. Right. Uh, economic hardship. Uh, remember, one quarter of all kids grew up in poverty conditions. Right. And then quite a bit of talk about gender roles, uh, often by the female writers who weren't necessarily very happy about exactly how the Chinese American community, uh, community looked at uh, females. Coming to the United States, uh, a good number of the essay writers and also the interviewers presented a pretty good story. Right? Yes, in the beginning there was trouble, right? but they got enough support from all sorts of people, including their family, but also maybe friends and so on. Uh, siblings, grandparents, because Chinese parents often work, there were quite a few 
uh, writers who actually were brought up by their grandma more than their mother or father. Right? That was not uncommon. Right? And so they sort of uh, feel, yes, there was trouble, but ultimately it's a good journey. Right? However, not everybody wrote such a positive story. Right? And there were a good number of them who felt that uh, what happened to them, right, uh, both in the beginning but sometimes also later, especially if they went to a not very good school where there were problems, uh, that they were disappointed. Right? And we're going to see later on some of these disappointments. Because there are different, quote, dialects. That's the term the Chinese government uses in the Chinese community. And what that really means is that spoken Chinese may not be understood. So the uh, Min dialect speakers in uh, Fuzhou and so on cannot be understood by Cantonese speakers in most cases. Right? So what that really means is that you have somewhat separate Chinese communities. Right. For instance, if you go to Baruch College, where there are quite a few Chinese students, you will find a good number from Fujian province, and they sort of hang out amongst each other. And so that's one. So don't think of Chinese as being Chinese. What you really should be thinking is there are all these sub-ethnic groups right, that outsiders usually are not aware of. Right, but that can be pretty important in the Chinese American community. Right? They uh, may be able to communicate mostly with their parents, but parents have their own problems. They have to survive. Right? And so some of these uh, essay writers said, I don't really quote, bother my parents, they already have enough problems. Right? Some say, my parents are really not paying that much attention to me because they're preoccupied with survival stuff. Right? And uh, because there's so much hard work, that uh, may have a negative effect on not only parent-child relationships, but also on the marriages. Quite a few parents back in China might have uh, had pretty good position, but because they don't speak English or speak it poorly, they can't have the same position in New York City. So they, from the point of view of position, they're going downhill. So they're now waiters in a restaurant or have a little shop where they sell this or that and so on and so on. Right? So that's one pressure some, uh, quite a few parents experience. Right? And I could give you many examples. Right? True, of course, for other immigrants. Right? For instance, uh, I sometimes take a cab and there are quite a few Pakistani cab drivers. And since I've been in Pakistan a few times, you know, I often try to have a little conversation uh, about what's going on there right now, trouble, right? but also, uh, you know, what they think about cab being a cab driver and so on. And needless to say, some would say, yeah, you know, I had a business back in Lahore or wherever in, in Pakistan, right? A good number of the Chinese in New York City are smuggled in. The smugglers are called snakeheads. Right. There's a famous book incidentally called The Snakehead, which is about a businesswoman on East Broadway living, you know, remember that picture, East Broadway, East Broadway, actually she lived right there in the picture, so to speak, and she supposedly made $40 million smuggling people in. Right. And uh, finally, uh, the American justice system caught up with her. She ended her life in a prison in Texas. But there is a statue of her back in a home village in Fujian province. So from the point of view of many of those people that she smuggled in, which is a, obviously a risky business, she was a heroine. Even though they had to pay plenty of money, 
Uh, it's still, she had sort of a reputation of being reasonably honest under the circumstances. Right? And sometimes if the smuggling didn't uh, work out, which of course happened, she would give people back at least some of the money that they had already uh, paid them to her or her group. Right. Parents in the eyes of the children, right. uh, one fairly common uh, attitude was, my parents, they know exactly what they want from me and they tell me a hundred times from early on. Right. Of course, there are exceptions to this, right? And uh, so they see the parents as relatively controlling, right? Especially if they compare themselves with sort of mainstream Americans or what they hear about this, right? But they also understand that the parents make huge sacrifices and that they live very tough lives, right? So what do the parents expect? Well, they hope that their kid will marry some other Chinese or Asian uh, and uh, have a good career, right? Uh, if you ever hear about Tiger Mothers, you know, famous book, right? Uh, written by a Yale professor, and uh, that's sort of an extreme version of the sort of tough child rearing, right? And very important filial piety it's called in Chinese, you must take care of your parents uh, once they retire. Right? Especially remember because quite a few of these parents are financially not well off. Right? And they're in a foreign country where they didn't grow up and they don't even speak the language or speak it imperfectly. Uh, don't drop up out of school of course. Right. Later on, we're going to see whether that's true. Uh, dating culture is not very popular for the daughters. It's a little more easygoing with the sons. Right. Actually, the intermarriage rates between Chinese women and white uh, husbands is quite high. Same true for Koreans, incidentally, especially second and third generation. Right. Uh, and uh, so, so like a little joke, some of these husbands are supposed to have yellow fever, right? meaning they're interested in dating East Asian women. Right? And the community uh, looks rather ambivalently uh, at all of this. Right? Language barriers, I think that's obvious. Uh, most second generation Chinese Americans in New York City speak some Chinese dialect with their parents, but they often say, you know my Chinese isn't so good. I talk like a seven year old or whatever. And when I want to talk about something really about my emotions and complicated things, I can't do it. They usually don't read Chinese because to learn to read Chinese characters means you have to learn thousands of characters, a lot of rote learning. Right? So about 80% at least in the samples we have of those who are second generation, right? they say I don't understand written Chinese or you know I can read 20 or 30 or 50 characters and that's about it. Right? There are some language brokers, and what that means is that the parents speak Chinese only and read Chinese only, but they have to deal with the rest of the world, right? So if they have their business, they have to go to lawyers or some uh, people from New York City or whatever, and they use their kids as the translators, right? So for instance, I remember an interview where the young woman basically said, you know, at age eight, I already was asked by my parents to go to lawyers together with the parent and translate all that legal stuff, including them stuff that maybe uh, she shouldn't hear as a little kid or didn't understand for that matter. Right? 
So that can be difficult. Sometimes uh, parents may also complain that uh, their uh, daughter or son is too Americanized. There's a term for this. Uh, Juxing, which is sort of like a hollow bamboo stick cut off at both sides, meaning you're cut off of the Chinese culture, you're hollow, right? I think the symbolism is obvious, and you're cut off from the American culture, you, you're somewhere in between, but you're nowhere. Right? So that's a pretty nasty term. Right? Uh, nicer terms are, for instance, banana. And some of the uh, interviewers would use this term, sort of ironic, yeah, I am a banana. Right? Uh, I think African Americans, the marshmallow you might have heard, externally brown, internally white, externally, quote, yellow, internally white. I think we all understand the symbolism of that. Right. Education. Right. There is sort of a widespread, not universal, but widespread assumption that uh, one reason why we parents and grandparents came here is so that you, daughter, son, right, can do better than we did in financial terms, uh, educational terms, and so on. So there's a strong emphasis on education. One way to see this is when you go to Chinatown, there are a lot of businesses that are basically tutorial services. Right? Sometimes to learn Chinese, right, and Chinese culture, but sometimes also to do better on SATs or whatever. Right? And that's an East Asian tradition. South Korea, China, Taiwan, Japan, they all have this stuff to an amazing degree. East Asia is the most education-obsessed part of the world. If you want to talk to Dr. Kim, who is teaching cross-cultural psych here, about his Korea past, he will tell you. Unfortunately, quite a few students would talk about anti-Asian or anti-Chinese uh, prejudice. Right. Uh, there was a high school in Brooklyn called Lafayette High School, right, which was ultimately closed because of a lot of fighting where many Chinese students got beaten up. Right, including, for instance, the valedictorian. He was beaten unconscious. Right. And it got so bad that some, uh, after a while, they had to close the school, even though the Board of Ed was reluctant to do this. You know, that uh, obviously presents lots of problems, right? So sometimes the prejudice can be really bad. If, however, you go to a really good high school, uh, that's much less of a problem, right? So it varies from uh, neighborhood uh, to neighborhood and how good the schools are, and I will say something about this. Right? Many of the parents, uh, if you ask them, for instance, what would happen if your daughter marries or your son marries, let's say, somebody from different ethnic groups, it's very clear they have a pecking order. Right? And uh, whether that's good or bad, uh, I think a lot of people wouldn't be too happy to hear this, but it's true. Right. Uh, quite a few slurs. Yeah, you know, some that don't even sound that uh, bad. You know, of course you know Kung Fu, you know, martial arts, even though many, of course, don't. Right? Uh, you're good at math. Right. It is true that Chinese Americans get slightly higher math scores, right, on SAT <coughs> and so on. But needless to say, there were, for instance, quite a few interviewees who would say, I'm not really that good at math. They were almost proud to say this, right, because I was against the stereotype. Right. And uh, slanted eyes, especially for little kids, you know, other little kids would make fun of you and uh, needless to say, if you're a little kid, that, uh, that you, you're going to remember that for a long time. Right. Uh, 
so there was quite a bit of discrimination going on, right? And uh, it seemed to have the worst effects if there were already family tensions about whatever, right? Then, over and above this uh, experience in the schools that uh, make quite a few of these writers pretty unhappy. Right. Gender roles, right, which are very clear cut in traditional Chinese culture. Right. The oldest son traditionally uh, was most important and in the old system, younger siblings would for instance address the oldest son as elder brother, not by his first name. That would have been not polite. Right? This is sort of starting to weaken, you know, Chinese culture is shifting rapidly. Right? So, uh, but you find it most often in this sort of more traditional rural areas. Uh, if uh, the immigrant comes from one of the big cities like Shanghai or Hebei and so on, you hear less of this, right. and uh, there were, especially in the working class for Chinese community, there's still the expectation: you, the daughter, you marry pretty early, and you have some kids. That's why we came here. Remember, China used to have not now, but used to have a one-child policy, right? From not for all, but for many families, while here in New York you can have as many kids as possible. Right. Just sort of go a little bit body image. Right. Uh, that was, uh, I was surprised, a uh, pretty common preoccupation with some of the female writers. Right. And they would sort of write about their Barbie dolls, you know, with their blue eyes and blonde hair and why they sort of felt I should be like this Barbie doll as an example. Right. Again, there were other writers who wouldn't have this attitude, but still there was a distinct subgroup of people who had body image uh, problems. Right. I'm going to go a little bit ahead. This is an advertisement. I took this picture in Manhattan, Chinatown, and I think the message is clear. The wider the better. Right. In the Chinese traditional community, if you're somewhat more dark-skinned, it actually means you are a peasant who works in the rice fields, and your skin gets uh, darker, you know, I don't know whether you know anything about working in rice fields, but believe me, it's a tough job, right? And that's no good. Right? So you sometimes in Chinatown you see uh, people with in, in the middle of the summer with an umbrella, right? And sometimes, and it's often females, right? It's about this business. Right? What do the boys worry about? Well, this is a little uh, thing I bought. Right? It's a series of cartoons and so on in Chinatown. So oh, 12 or 13 year olds. Right? What does uh, Mr. 12 year old want to be? A big shot. Right? That's the message. Right? And behind this, if you read uh, sort of web conversations among Chinese males, especially in the adolescent years, there's often something like, I can't get any white dates. And it's a common complaint. Right? So why? Because in part it is that a Chinese person on average is somewhat smaller, right? and that's part of, uh, you know, you should be a tough uh, football player. You know, you go to Texas high school and you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's ideal. Right. I'm going to jump over some. Here is a very interesting, unusual case, a high school student right, who joined the wrestling team which basically meant she was wrestling with boys. 
and her family went bananas. Right? She suddenly would get phone calls from uncle so-and-so who hadn't talked to her in the last three years, basically telling him, don't do this. Right? But she didn't listen and for a while was a member of this wrestling team. Right. She came into a middle-class community in Queens, right, and I can imagine some of these family conversations. Right. So this is, all, of course, there are many exceptions to what I just was talking about. Needless to say, there's all sorts of things going on. Right, 650,000 people. Obviously, you will get many different situations for all sorts of reasons, but that's sort of a fun situation. Educational performance. Here we are in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. Here's mom and her two daughters. One is here, the other one turned her back. Right? What is she studying? Well, uh, how about going to tutorial school? Right? And let me repeat, Chinese communities are famous for the tutorial schools. And China is full of uh, tutorial schools, as is Jap uh, Japan and uh, South Korea. Right? So there's nothing very unusual about this. Here is the biggest school of them all on Mott Street in Manhattan, Chinatown, just to the uh, left called CCBA, Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, which used to be sort of almost like the government of Chinatown before the uh, 1970s or so. Incidentally, it was uh, Taiwanese flags on top, right? We are here on a Saturday afternoon. Those kids, notice a disproportionate number of boys, they were in that tutorial school. Sometimes the school is there to teach Chinese culture and language. Sometimes, uh, depending on whoever the kid is, right, the school is about doing better right, and preparing yourself uh, to do really well when you graduate from high school. Right? These are the parents or sometimes, you know, maybe an uncle or whatever. Right? That school is said to have more than 6,000 students a year. Probably the biggest Chinese after school in the country. In the evening, you also see adults. These are Chinese adults who want to learn English. So it's not all about kids. And they have all sorts of culture programs. Right? For instance, I remember once going there, and there was a special ceremony for Confucius Day. Right? Okay, so becoming an educational dragon, that's a term sometimes used, right? Uh, in Chinese history, there was what's called the imperial examinations, where the, uh, a son of a peasant, in principle, if he did extremely well, could rise into the top group in Beijing, or you know, the capital shifted over time, right? no matter how modest his background. Right. There was nothing like this in Europe. Right. And, uh, and he was extremely honored. They have these ancestor halls, especially in southern China, where you even now can read so-and-so in 1763 came in top of the uh, imperial examination score. Right? He will be famous forever. Right. Now, of course, uh, when uh, China became a republic, 1911-1912, that, uh, that system was over, but it does have this long-term effect on education. The most famous high school in New York City, Stuyvesant High School, 73% right. in Stuyvesant High School are Asian. While the number of students in high schools in New York, uh, the percentage of students in, uh, in uh, New York City overall is about 16 percent. 
And so they're overrepresented by a factor of more than four. Uh, it's only have a friend who used to go to that high school some decades ago. In those days, he was Armenian. He would tell me it was a Jewish high school. Right? Most people there going there were Jewish. He was Armenian. He was sometimes the only kid in a class who wasn't Jewish. Right? So, uh, so there's still a, a considerable percentage of persons of Jewish and other background, but there's no doubt uh, what the message is. This is the book by Kazinitz, which I mentioned, who will be here uh, on, on March 29th, right? And these are various groups. Um, in the background, these percentages are the ones who got a BA. In the foreground, the blue stuff here, there's a percentage in a given group of people who dropped out of high school. Right? Guess who's doing best? The Chinese. Uh, also doing well are Russian Jews and whites, but the Chinese have the lowest dropout rate and the highest rate of people who got their B, uh, BA by the age of 25. Right. And there are huge differences among these cultural groups. Right. This doesn't explain why these differences are, but it tells you uh, the, the differences are quite striking. This is a, you know, sort of an overview, Stuyvesant High School, Bronx High School of Science, Brooklyn Technical High School, notice Asian Pacific always are the, by far the largest group, right? And so the representation of groups is extremely unequal. There are now efforts underway to say they shouldn't get to do these high schools just on the basis of a score on an examination, which is now true. Right? Whether it will happen or not, we will see. You know, it's a, needless to say a highly politicized conversation right? uh, with many repercussions. This is just another way to talk about Stuyvesant in high school. So these are the Asians, these are the whites, and blue are Hispanic, and blacks are black. Right. All right, so what can we conclude from all of this? There are at least 650 persons of Chinese descent in this city, right? not including foreign students at NYU or Columbia. You know, there are thousands of Chinese students there. I'm not including them in this number, right, because they probably go, they're not immigrants, right? Uh, with uh, about a quarter of the kids growing up in poverty. Right? Why do the Chinese come here? The two, not the only reasons, but the two most important reasons are economics and a better chance to have your kids educated because it's so much tougher in China to get into a university or college than here. Right? There are also sometimes political reasons in the 90s, for instance, when Hong Kong in 97 became returned to China, right? it used to be a British colony basically, and in 97 they went back, but they still have a special legal status. There were several hundred thousand, mostly middle class Hong Kongers who came to United States or Canada or Australia and so on because they were worried what would happen to uh, you know, for instance, that business. I thought maybe the communist government is just going to sort of uh, take it over. Right. When they learned that this didn't happen, by and large, uh, quite a few went back to Hong Kong. Right. So you have these subgroups that uh, don't fit what I have been talking about for various reasons. For instance, people from Hong Kong, especially in the 80s and 90s. Right. So what do you have to understand in order to understand Chinese Americans? Of course, a lot, much more than you know, I've been able to discuss here. Uh, I talked about social class background, gender roles, and so on and so on. But of course, there are many other considerations. Right? Here's one. There are some Chinese families in the Fujianese community. When a child is born here, about half a year later, they sent this child, which is now an American citizen, you're born here, you're a citizen, right? 
back to China, where the kids brought up, often by some grandmother or so. And when the kids five or six, right, uh, ready to go to elementary school, the kids brought back, but the parents are so strangers for some of these kids. My grandma is the attachment person, not uh, daddy or mommy. Right? So they are clear, uh, and they often don't speak English. So these kids uh, clearly present a emotional, psychological, linguistic, and whatever have you uh, problem in, in a good number of cases. Right? Just as an example of things I didn't really discuss uh, in detail. So, uh, is there a price for this focus on education? Of course. Right. If you're driven to do well in education, needless to say, you're going to worry. And there are some studies showing that, for instance, Chinese female students have rather high depression rates, right. at, including at Stuyvesant, right? Education among the most successful students. Right. So that extreme emphasis on education on the one hand helps upward social mobility and educational mobility. On the other hand, it's tough and not everybody is happy. Thank you very much for your attention.